Thank you all so much for being here today. I believe it is fitting that we're here on what is recognized globally as World AIDS Day. I'm Laura Angel. I'm Vice President for Advancement with the CDC Foundation. And I'm not Dr. Judy Monroe, President and CEO, as noted in your program. Judy sends her regrets and her highest regards to each of you. She so wanted to be here today. Uh, to celebrate not only World AIDS Day, but this amazing program that you're, you're going to hear so much about, and to celebrate the true public health heroes that were involved in the front lines in the early days. Um, many of you here may know about the CDC Foundation and be familiar with our work, but for those of you who do not, um, I want to let you know that the CDC Foundation helps CDC save and improve more lives. And we do that by unleashing the power of collaboration between CDC and others, philanthropies, private entities, individuals, you name it, but the, with the end game of helping to protect the health, safety, and security of the world. And so the program that we're here to discuss today is a perfect example of that work in action. And today's event is the culmination of an effort to chronicle CDC's early response to AIDS. But of course, efforts like this do not just happen uh, by themselves, and it takes an army of people to pull something like this together. And, and so I want to provide a bit more uh, perspective on how this effort developed and evolved. The story starts 40 years ago in June 1981. That's when the Morbidity and Mortality Report, MMWR, published a description of five cases of pneumonia among homosexual men in Los Angeles. This was the first published report about what would become known as acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, or AIDS. Soon after, CDC formed a task force under the direction of Dr. Jim Curran to initiate surveillance, conduct epidemiologic and laboratory investigations, and develop prevention recommendations. These efforts established the fundamental clinical and epidemiologic features of the disease before HIV was identified in 1983. Several years ago, there was a growing realization at CDC that apart from the scientific publications, the government reports, and public health guidelines, um, there was very little historical information and documentation about CDC's amazing and critical role in the initial uh, recognition, investigation, and their leadership during the AIDS epidemic. And so with AIDS in its fourth decade, uh, there was also a realization that the ability to gather and document and preserve this information was fast eroding. Many of the CDC scientists, public health advisors, and other staff who worked during those early years um, had already or were soon retiring, and unfortunately some had even died, and their stories would never be chronicled. So I'm really pleased that there were those at CDC, the CDC Foundation, Emory University Libraries, and in the donor community who appreciated the need to chronicle these stories and thereby save learnings uh, from this initial work on AIDS that could be used by scientists and other advisors for future outbreaks. <clears throat> I'm so excited for all of us to hear about this work today, but before we move on to the next segment, um, I want to express profound gratitude for our, our generous donors who made this possible, Gilead Sciences and Abbott. Not every private sector organization would step forward to support an effort like this, but Gilead and Abbott recognize how important it is to capture these stories and share these learnings that will continue to advance public health protection activities in the future. In addition, I'd like to thank the, those at CDC that were so involved in bringing this work to life, the Project Advisory Board, and uh, again, Emory University Libraries, who were all so instrumental in the concept and development of capturing these stories. Some on this team are on today's program, including Doc, the David J. Sensor Museum Director, Judy Gant, um, who I'll ask to come forward at this time. And as Judy steps forward, I again just want to welcome all of you and thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, and thank you for making the special effort to be here today. We appreciate it. And thank you all. Welcome. And uh, friends of the museum, friends of CDC, friends of the Emory Libraries, so glad to have you. Um, the CDC Foundation has been our supporter 
um, in many projects over the years, and we are so grateful for that. Um, let's see, my slide did not change. Oh, I'm Judy Gant, and it's been my privilege <laughs> <laughs> to oversee the Early AIDS History Project since its inception in 2014 as part of the activities of the CDC Museum. You may not know now that we are the repository for the history of this agency, but this is about to change. As you will learn, we collect, preserve, and inspire appreciation for CDC's history. How do we do that? Well, we organize and produce exhibitions, both temporary, periodic, special, and permanent. You walked right by our Ebola exhibition, maybe if you walked in from the visitor center, the visitor parking lot today. Um, it's temporary. And if you looked over the rail, you saw this exhibit, our early AIDS exhibit, um, which is permanent um, in the story of CDC. Another way we do it is to design and develop educational programs, interactive family tours, curators' conversations with CD subject matter, CDC subject matter experts, special programs related to our temporary uh, exhibitions, uh, like uh, plays in the gallery, lectures, films, panel discussions. Um, we provide content for the CDC app. We do special programs for the Atlanta Science Center and the Smithsonian Museum Day, since we're a, a Smithsonian affiliate. And for the past 12 years, we've held two sessions of the CDC Museum Disease Detective Camps every summer, wherein high school students learn to be disease detectives. They learn about epidemiology, everything from the initial surveillance of an outbreak to communicating with the public once it once the something has been discovered um, for prevention. So the camp introduces students to the breadth and depth of CDC's work in history and the work of public health. And finally, we collect, preserve, and inspire appreciation for, the, for CDC's, history, CDC's history through our physical and web archives. This is one of our largest artifacts. This is our uh, transmission electron microscope that was actually purchased in 1985 to work on AIDS and was retired in 2005 and went to Emory and worked there for many years and then we got it back. The museum got it back and we're able to put it on display. And it's one of our uh, visitors favorite things to, to look at and Cynthia Goldsmith who I think is here um, goes by and pats it every time she comes. Um, so I, as I mentioned when we started, we are the repository for the history of the agency, and that's why we're here today, and we're going to hear all about the archives shortly. But first I want to talk about this man who inspired us to do more. Um, he was a passionate supporter of the CDC Museum. He's the longest serving director of CDC, as many of you know, from 66 to 1966 to 1977. And he started many years after he retired coming to the museum, just coming in every day. And he started calling me boss. And he would call up and say, I've got to go to the dentist this morning. I won't be in, boss. Um, we gave him a cubicle. We said, well, you're the division of institutional memory. And he advised us on everything we did. He was our biggest fan and our biggest constructive critic who helped us improve in so many ways. Um, and he felt strongly that CDC's story of the early years of AIDS needed to be told. Um, so what you're going to see and hear about today is the result of the hard work of our team, Mary Hilpertshauser, Rachel Gundecker, uh, Mary Chamberlain, and Bess Miller. But we always have him on our shoulder. It was Dr. Sensor's idea to partner with the Emory Libraries, and it's been a wonderful collaboration that you'll hear more about from Mary Hilpertshauser. Dr. Sensor and Harold Jaffe, who is here today, along with Dr. Jim Curran, who is also here today, Dean of the Rollins School of Public Health, and Steve Sensor, Senior Vice President and General Counsel at Emory, were scheduled to meet about the AIDS archive shortly before Dr. Sensor died in 2011. So that meeting never happened. But people like Bob Chin and others at CDC were thinking about what should happen with all the materials that people were maybe or maybe not hoarding 
Um, and in 2014, Bess Miller reintroduced the idea and encouraged the museum to meet with the CDC Foundation to take it forward. Thanks to funding from Harold Jaffe's office, the office of the uh, Associate Director for Science, we began the project with the aim of capturing voices through oral histories and collecting things, documents and posters and photographs, uh, ephemera and artifacts to preserve this important time in CDC's work. We couldn't have started without this initial support and it was later supplemented by funds from the Office of the um, Chief of Staff, uh, led then by Carmen Villar. So these two special advisors to the project are very, very dear to us. The museum is part of the Office of the Associate Director for Communication, and I want to acknowledge their support as well. And then in 2015, we submitted a, a project concept form, like you do, to the CDC Foundation and received generous funding, as you've heard from Laura from Abbott and Gilead Sciences. The CDC Foundation has helped us with budgets, personnel, logistics, travel, meetings, and has really been a true partner, and we're so grateful to you all. Finally, we're so fortunate to have the support of these great people, our wonderful advisory board who were kind enough to join us uh, out of their busy day, had ideas about who to interview and why, as well as what the scope of the project should be. I think Jim Curran and Michael Melnick are here today, and we thank you so much for, for your help. Um, I do want to acknowledge also Dr. David Satcher, who is here and was the vision behind the original museum um, in 1996, the Global Health Odyssey, and we're so glad to have you here. I hope you'll stand up and take a hand. Now let me introduce Mary Hilpertshauser, our Historic Collections Manager in the museum who has been with us for the last 15 years and has grown our historic collection from a handful of items used to design that original museum in 1996 to a mighty collection of more than 75,000 items thanks to many donations from basements like yours. By the way, we're waiting. Um, Mary also serves as CDC's de, de facto historian, as her knowledge of CDC's 71-year history is legendary. Mary, thank you. Okay. Well, I'm legendary. Great. Well, hello, everyone, and thanks for coming today. I am. Mary Hilpertshauser, and as the Historic Collections Manager, I am responsible for the proper care and preservation of all objects in the museum, digital or physical. The Global Health Chronicles is where CDC's early response to AIDS collection can be found, and today I'm here to tell you all about the Global Health Chronicles. Before I talk about the Global Health Chronicles, let me explain what is an archive. <sighs> An archives is a collection of original historical documents or records providing primary source information about a person, a place, an institution, or a group of people. Archives are important because they house primary source documents, original materials that are unedited, unfiltered. These are raw repositories of knowledge. These are some of many of the types of archives. At the David J. Sensor CDC Museum, we not only display CDC's rich history, but maintain an archives and an artifact repository. To me, an archives is where memories are stored and where history is made. All physical archives have limitations. Limitations are there to, pre to preserve the collection from damage but those limitations can affect access. As many of these archives require an in-person visit to view their collections, sometimes you have to be a member of that community or part of the institution to view them. And sometimes the location of archive is prohibitive. And sometimes there are fees. Archives and collections are turning to digitization for preservation and to publish some of their collections online, but digitization can take a lot of time and it takes a lot of money. Which takes me to why we have the Global Health Chronicles Online Archives access. And this man. 
David Sensor, always a forward thinker. So way back in the year 2005, I was proudly showing David the collections we were acquiring at the museum. And he was nodding politely as I was explaining how the archives were organized when he suddenly asked, how do people get access to this? And I said, well, they have to come to the museum for an in-person visit. So we knew that these materials should be accessible to everyone, and the majority of the museum collection is in the public domain. So we discussed accessibility issues further with Judy, the museum's director. And we all thought the best solution for accessibility would be an online presence. And we decided we wanted it not to be like the other archives. We wanted it to be free, open access, available to anyone from anywhere, and it should be expandable. But we needed more than big ideas, and we needed support, and we needed funding. So the discussion was tabled. But, <laughs> but Dave's wheels kept spinning. And in 2006, when the West African smallpox eradication team was having a reunion, Dr. Fagey and Dr. Sensor thought it would be a great idea to take this opportunity with everybody in one place to record as many oral histories as possible in three days, including spouses. So we were able to record 31 oral histories, the seminars that were part of that weekend, and as a bonus, many, many documents and photographs were collected and donated over the weekend to the museum. And with this new collection, David Sensor was able to find funding. And together we established a partnership with Emory Libraries to publish these oral histories and archives on an online platform. The libraries would host the website, the museum would furnish the content. We decided to call it the Global Health Chronicles. This is what the, life, the website looked like when we launched in 2009. Sorry about the gruesome photo. Each chronicle would be a collection of CDC's work on a specific global health topic. The smallpox chronicle became very robust very quickly because in 2008, there was yet another reunion of the smallpox workers. <laughs> and we doubled that collection. So, we also thought we didn't want it to be just the smallpox chronicles. So with the help of the Carter Center, we were added the guinea worm chronicle, which would be a placeholder until we could find more funding to fill it out. The malaria chronicle was left under construction too until Dave found more funding, which he did. And now we could fill out and fill in the full story of how CDC's beginnings are tied to malaria. And with that funding, we hired a dedicated oral history historian, expanded our research capabilities, and worked with the National Archives in DC and Georgia, National Library of Medicine, and Emory's Manuscript and Rare Book Library. Dave died in 2011, but we knew we needed to continue to work on the malaria collection and dug deeper into CDC beginnings with thoughts for the future of the website. Malaria, CDC beginnings were published in 2012. But as years went by, the website grew old. It needed to work with the new fancier browsers, and it refused. It needed a redesign. By 2014, it was about 120 years old in internet years. <laughs> so when CDC's response to AIDS Chronicle became funded, we took this opportunity to redesign, again, working with Emory Libraries, they worked to find a more agile platform to run on, and we looked for ways to enhance the oral history component. Okay, now I've got to take you live to the website, so forgive me if I am not so smooth here, but it might be smooth. Oh, it was smooth. <laughs> here is the home page. This is what it looks like. Malaria moved over from the old site. Guinea worm moved to but it's still a fledgling chronicle looking for that funding. Okay, um, polio chronicle of the early days of CDC was added, and as well as Ebola, which is under construction and covers the 2013-2016 epidemic. And of course, smallpox moved over. And okay, forgive me, but I've got to show you this one photo. I mean, not photo, it is a, um, well, they're called, um, Back in the day, they were called newsreels, and they would play 
right before a movie in the theaters. Perhaps you saw them, but th it's called Miracle in Tonga. This is um, about a team of physicians that are evaluating a new, inexpensive, and rapid immunization device called a Petajet. And in Far here, in the South Pacific, you will see a very young Dr. Feggy. He is 28 years old. There he is, Petajetting away. Now, we have a Petajet just like this in the museum if you want to see one up close and personal. OK, back to the website. Why we're here. CDC's early response to AIDS. This is the website. This is their homepage. It has everything else that all the other chronicles have. It has documents and photographs and media. All of the um, chronicles have these related resources. This one is all about links to websites on HIV AIDS. But here we go to the oral histories. And as I said earlier, besides having a more nimble platform to run on, we wanted to enhance the oral history portion. Because oral history has grown as a primary source for historical and cultural documentation, yet it remains underutilized because oral history can be a cumbersome resource to use. Not a lot of people want to sit through hours and hours of recordings, and the cost of transcribing recordings can be very expensive. The alternative, automatic speech recognition software, well, that technology is not really along enough, especially for interviews that contain multiple dialects. Think how well Siri understands your voice. So we began to explore an application called OMS, which means it's the Oral History Metadata Synchronizer. And we found that we really liked what it can do. It isn't a transcription tool, but it allows an administrator to create a method or an index to annotate the oral history interview. The segment level descriptive metadata corresponds to a time code. Let me show you. It's easier to tell you. We'll go to Harry Habercoats. I'm going to stop this so we don't this hear it. So when you would look up typically an oral history, you'd find this classic transcript thing. You can browse through it if you want, and there are these little minute markers on the sides if you want to refer back to that recording at that minute. But what OMS does for us is put it into these, well, we make these segments, but this is the indexing mode. The interview is broken into segments, and you can go directly to a segment that'll play from that time code. Let's go to case control study. You can play right at that segment. Oh, the case control study. Yep, see? And you can also get a segment link if you need that. It gives you a partial transcript. It gives you a synopsis of that synopsis of that segment and keywords and subjects. And here down, you'll see a hyperlink. So in this segment, Dr. Habercoast is talking about the case control study protocol. This is the case control protocol that Dr. Habercoast is talking about. So you can call it up and read along with him. Now the heart and soul to OMS is the ability to actually search the entire index for a word. I'm going to search for AIDS. It will bring up all of the different segments that have that word in it. And you can go right to that place and find it. So much easier than having to scroll through hours and hours and hours of recordings. So that's the Global Health Chronicles in a nutshell. Uh, the new Omeka platform has allowed us this website to be dynamic, which means that it can be viewed on and conform in size to any device that you have. And OMS, Oral History Metadata Synchronizer, makes it easier for research researchers to call up precise segments and do a word search without having to listen to endless hours of tape. So the Global Health Chronicles access continues to be free and available to anyone. And I encourage you, oh, I got to go back to this thing. Laura, like, can you yell at me? Oh, that's the wrong one. I encourage you to go and look at the website. 
not this one, but the new one. And I do would like to hear from you. I would encourage you to look at it and give me some feedback, any questions, so please direct that feedback to my email right here. Okay, hurry, write it down because now in this next segment we present the oral histories from the CDC's early response to AIDS Chronicle. I'm very proud to introduce the next two speakers, Bess Miller and Mary Chamberlain. Bess came to CDC in 1981 as an EIS officer and was one of the early investigators of what would become known as AIDS. She continued to work at CDC, oh wait, yeah, she continued to work at CDC for the next 30 years, focusing on what would become, which, uh, God, I'm all out of here, focusing on tuberculosis and HIV AIDS. For the second half of her career, she headed up the TB HIV activities for PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, working primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa. Mary began working at CDC in 1982 as an EIS officer assigned to New York City Department of Health then led by David Sensor. During her two years at New York City, she implemented the first hospital-based AIDS surveillance program in the United States and helped investigate some of the earliest AIDS cases. Much of her subsequent CDC career focused on emerging infectious disease. Bess, Mary, your turn. In June and July of 1981, the first cases of pneumocystis pneumonia and Kaposi's sarcoma in gay men were reported from Los Angeles and New York City. Who could have predicted that by 2017, 78 million persons would become infected, 35 million would die, and 37 million would be living with HIV? Mary and I will describe the objectives and methods of this oral history and then present a sample of excerpts from the interviews conducted so far. Because of limited time and because some of the interviews are still being processed, unfortunately we weren't able to show excerpts from all of the interviews today, but hopefully in the future we would like to. We wanted to tell the story of individuals who worked on AIDS during the early years. But in doing this, we wanted to tell a story about how CDC works. What do we value? What is our corporate culture? What niche did we fill in responding to this syndrome that would become a global pandemic? Oral histories of early AIDS work had been published both online and in book form in it for numerous groups, most notably National Institutes of Health, AIDS Doctors in New York City, and AIDS in San Francisco. There was no such oral history for CDC. Our goal was to conduct 50 interviews of current and former CDC staff who worked on AIDS with a focus on the early years. We wanted to include a wide variety of personnel, including CDC leadership, EIS officers, epidemiologists, public health advisors, laboratorians, communications personnel, and legal staff, the whole spectrum. The interviews were conducted individually in person at CDC in the Division of Communications recording studios, and Mary and I were the interviewers. We were fortunate to have some excellent instruction on conducting an oral history from those listed here, and we'd like to especially highlight Dr. Victoria Harden, who for many years was a historian at NIH. Mary and I went to Washington to study with Dr. Harden for a couple of days, and she was very excited about this project and shared her expertise freely. Now, conducting an oral history interview is an art and a science. 
some guides actually suggest doing as much as 40 hours of work at a minimum before each interview. You want to know everything you can about your interviewee. What brought them to CDC? And for the areas they're working on, what are the scientific, clinical, or political circumstances at the time? What cutting edge approaches and tools do we want to try and explore during the interview? The next step is to develop the questionnaire and kind of keep it loosely structured. We included some common questions for all the interviews, but then tailored the rest according to the interviewee. Now, we didn't share the final questionnaire because we wanted to promote some spontaneity, an oral history, not a deposition. So the delicate balance was in leading the interviewee by the questions, but then following along with the interviewee's narrative. Finally, the interview. Here comes the magic. Most of the interviews lasted one and a half to two hours, and at some point during the interview, you experience time travel. It's 1982, and you are there. You're not 30 again, but you're there. Key members of our team were the videographers listed here. We want to give a special thanks to Todd Jordan, who videotaped most of the interviews and was an integral part of our team. Todd, would you be willing to stand? We have conducted 39 interviews to date. In the next few slides and clips from the interviews, I'd like to share the perspective of those who responded to the publication of those early MMWR reports during the earliest days in the summer of 1981. So first, the CDC director, Dr. Bill Fagey. Here he describes how he supported the earliest efforts to address the new disease. We were absolutely bewildered by those first cases. And once the MMWR went out, suddenly we found there were many more cases. Uh, New York and Los Angeles and Miami and San Francisco all had cases but they hadn't put this together that this was a new problem until that MMWR article. Yes, we were bewildered and we were soon overwhelmed. One of the heroes in this story is Paul Wiesner, who immediately put people from the uh, STD program, the Sexually Transmitted Disease Program, on the investigation. So he wasted no time in responding to this. I think two of the other heroes turned out to be Jim Curran and Harold Jaffe, who headed up then the uh, AIDS program. And we put this in the front office when we realized how big this was so that we could be sure to provide as much support as was possible from the front office. These people were exceptional. I mean, uh, I look back at the things we did right and getting the right people turned out to be one of the things. the director, Center for Infectious Diseases. Here, Dr. Dowdle recalls the struggle to identify resources. As to whether we had the resources, the answer was absolutely not, but you have to make, you know, you have to make room to do what you have to do, and you have to ex actually start setting priorities very quickly if, if you're going to move to that which appears to be a major public health issue. Can you say more about that? Uh, did, you, did you rob Peter to pay Paul? Is yes, of course. It? Yeah, because your, your resources to some extent were, were important and that was more of an issue in the epidemiology that needed a lot of travel, for example, but in the case of the laboratory, a lot of what was needed to start the investigations were there, but the big problem was personnel. And uh, as we've explained to 
the people in Washington time and time again that you don't convert a parasitologist to a virologist. It's, they are different, and, uh, and if you don't have that depth, then you're restrained without uh, quite a question. As to the leader of the task force on Kaposi sarcoma and opportunistic infections. Dr. Jim Curran describes how CDC meets the challenge by seconding experts from divisions throughout the agency to an ad hoc task force on Kaposi sarcoma and opportunistic infections. One of the really good things is that CDC swarms on new problems uh, th with the Epidemic Intelligence Service and the general mentality of, of coming to the threat. So the Epidemic Intelligence Service, which of course included you, Dr. Miller, uh, said we want to deal with this new problem. So despite the financial constraints that we had and the personnel hiring constraints, we had an eager group of people that came from throughout the agency, people working on cancer, people working on virology, people working on STDs, people working on environmental issues. And all were sort of assigned together in this ad hoc task force that we, we called Kaposi sarcoma and opportunistic infections because we wanted people to think, realize that we consider this not just an epidemic of cancer, not just an epidemic of infections, but an epidemic of a conglomeration of things forming a syndrome, which of course now we know is HIV and immunodeficiency. One week after the publication of the June 5th MMWR, Dr. Curran visited a hospitalized patient with disseminated Kaposi sarcoma in a New York City hospital. I wanted to show you this clip because it reminds us of the terrible fear and suffering the patients endured during these early days. And I, I can't help but remember the time I met that man. Um, it turned out that we had much more in common than we had uh, in differences. He and I were uh, exactly the same age. Uh, he, we had both gone to Catholic prep schools in Detroit who were football rivals of each other. Uh, he might have been a little bit smarter. He had a scholarship to Yale in acting. And I went to Notre Dame, became a physician. And he was a handsome actor who had these blotches on his face. Um, and he said, Doc, you know, from CDC, what do you think? Can we get rid of these? You know, am I gonna, is this going to hurt my career? And, of course, I had never seen a case of Kaposi sarcoma in my life, uh, and I didn't know what to tell him. Uh, unfortunately, he was treated with very uh, aggressive uh, chemotherapy, which probably hastened his disease course. And he... Um, I, I had a chance to see him several more times before he died, and actually the week he died uh, in the ICU at NYU. And what struck me in that first encounter is how similar our backgrounds were and how different things turned out for him, that uh, but for the grace of God and this damn virus, that could have been me. The lead epidemiologist for the task force on Kaposi sarcoma and opportunistic infections, Dr. Harold Jaffe describes attending the annual STD meeting, which was in San Diego in June of 81, where he learns about more patients with these diseases. Well, the next thing I remember was there was a uh, annual STD meeting in San Diego that year. I think it was in June. And I went and we arranged a meeting with a group of physicians who primarily took care of gay patients, gay male patients, to find out whether they'd been seeing this. And I remember sitting in this hotel room uh, talking to these people, some of whom I knew and some I didn't. And I remember talking to a physician from San Francisco named Robert Bolin. And he said, uh, what do you know about Kaposi sarcoma? And 
And I said, I don't, I don't know anything about it. He said, well, I have patients in my practice, which is primarily of gay men, and I've seen several cases of Kaposi's sarcoma. I wonder if it has something to do with this weird illness that's taking place. So I said, well, I don't know. I'll, I'll ask when I get back to Atlanta. And I specifically remember writing the name Kaposi sarcoma down on a slip of paper and putting it into my wallet because I was worried I'd forget the name before I got back to Atlanta. It's becoming clear that reports of these diseases are increasing and that this is not a transient episode. Dr. Draffy describes the early days of developing a surveillance system which demanded a case definition for these diseases. Actually, not a very easy task. Well, over the summer, it became clear that this wasn't an isolated event. You know, we were starting to hear about cases not just from Los Angeles, but from San Francisco and New York. It wasn't just pneumocystis. It wasn't just Kaposi sarcoma. We were hearing about other opportunistic infections, possibly some other malignancies. So we thought, well, whatever this is, it isn't just a fluke. It's not something peculiar to these five men in Los Angeles. There must be something bigger going on. So that's when we really started thinking about how to organize our activities. Um, one of the first things we did was institute a surveillance system. So up until then, we just were relying on physicians calling us and saying, uh, you know, I saw one of those. And you'd say, what do you mean by one of those? Well, somebody who sounds like one of these cases that was in the MMWR, a young gay man with this infection or this malignancy. But we didn't have a working case definition. We were just writing down what they told us and sticking it in a file cabinet. We were writing down the names of patients, which we would never do now. So we thought we, we need a formal surveillance system, and the first thing you need to do that is a case definition. So we made one up, and we said essentially we're interested in uh, otherwise healthy individuals who've developed one of a series of opportunistic infections, and we listed out about 12 of them, I think, or Kaposi's sarcoma in somebody under age 60. And we excluded people with an obvious cause of immune deficiency, an organ transplant recipient, or somebody taking cancer chemotherapy. And we distributed this case definition to teaching hospitals, to dermatologists, oncologists, and health departments, and asked the cases be reported from the physician to the health department to CDC. So that was, I think, a major activity during the summer. The EIS officer in the task force on Kaposi sarcoma and opportunistic infections, Dr. Harry Haverpost. Once the surveillance system was established, CDC began re receiving numerous reports of the new diseases, initially from New York City and California, and then from all parts of the country. Here, Dr. Haverpost describes taking phone duty to implement the newly developed surveillance system. I spent the whole day on the phone, basically. And physicians would call, they'd tell me about, about their cases, I'd fill out the reports, they'd ask me questions. Got a couple of calls from the press, but they, they weren't too interested. Patients would call, uh, health departments would call, you know, I, we had work going out there. Yeah, I can, I can still remember, we didn't have speaker phones in those days, so I would, and my ear was would just burn. I mean, it was it was hot. It generates quite a bit of heat. I changed to this year and that year, uh, so I was on the phone uh, constantly. But yeah, no, they uh, uh, they were looking for information just as we were. I think our relations with academic docs were very good, except for a few. There were a couple of groups who I won't mention who. We're going to write their cases up for the New England Journal, so they weren't going to call us until it got published. But that resolved after publication. But yeah, no, I thought our, our interactions with uh, with uh, with people went very well. I mean, I enjoyed these. I like talking to people, so for me, it was a lot easier than taking call and going into the intensive care unit back at the University of Pittsburgh. It was it was a lot of fun. Before I hand the podium over to Mary, 
I'd like to say what an honor and privilege it's been to work on this project with the outstanding team that manages the CDC Museum, with Judy Gant and Mary Hilpert Souser. These are real CDC treasures. Let's now turn to Mary, who will pick up the story. Thank you, Beth. Well, in addition to implementing surveillance, the task force undertook a number of epidemiologic studies to investigate the new disease, to establish how it was transmitted, and to develop recommendations for prevention. One of the very first was a national case control study in late 1981. It included most of the living patients in the United States at that time with Kaposi's sarcoma and pneumocystis pneumonia. Fifty gay men with AIDS were compared with control gay men, matched by city of residence, race, and age. It proved, however, a challenging study to design by surprisingly inexperienced scientists, as described in this clip. So we got more and more worried that this was actually something really big and it wasn't going to go away until we figured out what it was. So we started really, really concentrating on the case control study. Um, I remember sitting in my backyard uh, writing a questionnaire thinking, I don't know what I'm doing, but somebody has to do it. Fortunately, we had Bill Darrow with us. He was a research sociologist who'd had a lot of experience. Uh, interviewing gay men, and he was very helpful with a questionnaire. But then, uh, more fundamentally, I'd never done a case control study, and I thought, well, I'm not even sure I'm doing this right. So I remember getting some CDC epidemiologists who were not part of the task force, like Ward Cates, um, to look at it and say, does, does this sound right to you? And he said yes, so that made me feel more confident. The study was coordinated by Drs. Harold Jaffe and Martha Rogers. It was conducted in New York City, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Atlanta. It, it was comprised of in-person interviews and specimen collection. It was also a challenging study to implement. And in this clip, Dr. Mary Guinan describes the local logistics for interviewing participants in San Francisco. I had to go to San Francisco and find a hotel when I, finding a hotel was very difficult because of the uh, federal limit on our hotels, and which was $45 a night. So I had to find a hotel that had a refrigerator because I had to put the specimens in the refrigerator. So it was this really rundown hotel in the Tenderloin District of, um, San Francisco. It had like a, a a little kitchenette with a bar and and a and and a refrigerator. So and uh, then a public health advisor, Sal from San Francisco Health Department, came with all of the paraphernalia we needed, uh, boxes and labels and s syringes and needles and everything I needed to essentially do what he had to do. And we were taking specimens. Um, uh, blood specimens, oral swabs, rectal swabs. So um, that was the protocol. And then in this second clip, Mary relates a particularly hair-raising experience while obtaining specimens. And then I had a, a problem with, uh, there was a young man with AIDS who was very tall and built like a football player. And he agreed to give blood. And uh, so he sat on the stool and put his arm on, on the uh, kitchen counter there, the kitchenette counter. And I, I drew the blood from him. 
And as I was drawing the blood, he fainted, and he fell on top of me. And I, I couldn't, and I, try, I was trying to get the syringe, uh, the, the, uh, yeah, the tourniquet the around the arm. The tourniquet. I, I tried to get the tourniquet off, and I couldn't get the tourniquet off. And then I, when he fell on top of me, I pulled the needle out and stuck it in my hand. And, uh, but all I could think of was here was this person unconscious on the floor. I pulled this, the tourniquet off, and uh, I washed the blood out of, my, out of my hand, but here was this unconscious person on the floor, and I was wondering, how am I going to explain this? Do I have to call the police and an ambulance? And, and here I am with needles and syringes all over in this <laughs> hotel. Uh, unfortunately, he woke up. He had just, and then he apologized. He said that he had, um, you know, he, he always fainted at the sight of blood, and he should have told me. And, um, I, uh, and I asked him if I could use his other arm to take the blood, and if he would mind staying lying down. <laughs> The case control study found that case patients were more sexually active than the controls. They had more sexual partners, they had more sexually transmitted infections. But the authors were cautious in their conclusions, writing it was not possible to know if other variables, such as illicit drug use, played some role in the development of capacies and pneumocystis. It wasn't long, however, before an opportunity arose to examine the possibility of sexual transmission in more detail. In March of 1982, the Los Angeles County EIS officer, Dr. David Auerbach, learned about possible sexual linkages between four men with AIDS. Soon after, he and Bill Darrow, the research sociologist on the task force, interviewed 13 of the first 19 cases of AIDS in gay men in LA and Orange counties. Nine of the 13 reported sexual contact with one or more AIDS patients in the five years before symptom onset. Intriguingly, four of the nine reported contact with an early New York City case, a Canadian air steward whom they called patient O for outside of California. Finding one man who could be linked to cases on both the East and West Coast was viewed as a major breakthrough. In a 1984 newspaper interview, Dave Arbach is quoted as saying, I can tell you, we were startled. A couple of weeks later, Bill traveled to New York City to interview patient O, and in this clip, he relates some of what he learned. I was able to, to speak with him and talk to them, talk to him in, in Dr. Friedman Keene's office. Uh -huh. And I said uh, to him, um, we're, we're really interested in you and, and other people like you who are being seen here in this office with Kaposi sarcoma and other very serious conditions. How are you doing? And you know, you been recovering from chemotherapy. I think he had no hair at the time. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I'd like to talk to you some more about it. And, and so we had this conversation and I said to him, do you know of other people? He said, oh yeah, I know a lot of other people who've also got this. And I said, have you ever had sex with them? He said, why are you asking me that question? And I said, well, it might be possible that whatever you've got was transmitted during sexual intercourse. You know, there are sexually transmitted diseases. He said, wait a minute, who are you? Don't you know that cancer is a disease that's not spread by sexual intercourse? And I said, well, we haven't seen any cancers yet. And we hadn't. I don't think that we knew about human papillomavirus and so forth. Well, we haven't seen any or, or very few cases that are spread by cancer, but this might be one of them. He says, I don't believe you. I mean, this, this is, this is far-fetched. I've heard all kinds of strange things. I don't believe you. Well, you know, will you let me check it out? You know, how about you give me the names of your sex partners and let me check to see what kind of health they're in? He said, okay, but, you know, I can't remember them. There were so many. I said, do you have a black book or an address book? He said, I do have one. 
I do have one. I said, would you be willing to take a look at it? He said, of course, I'll tell you what's in there. I'm not, you know, I'm not holding anything back. I want to help. Uh, but I have to warn you, I recently updated it. I threw away a lot of old information. People that I, I said, okay, so uh, can I go back with you to your, no, 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 you can't go back with my apartment. I got too many other things to do. But you can call me. You can call me between 6 and 6.30 tonight. So, you know, and he gave me the phone number, and I said, okay, I'll call you. So I had to catch a plane that night back to uh, Atlanta from New York City, and I can remember in Grand Central Station, they had a bank of telephones, and I waited for one of those telephones to get free. I called him, and I said, hi, it's Bill Darrow from CDC. How are you doing? Do you have your address book handy? He said, I do. I said, okay, would you mind going through it with me? He said, not at all. So he started reading all the names, and he read, as I remember, 72, gave me information about 72 individuals on the phone until, you know, he said, it's 6.30, I gotta go now. I said, okay, can I call you back? He said, yeah, yeah, you can call me back, but not now, I've got other things to do. And I said, I've gotta catch a plane. So that's how I got those names. The investigation extended to cities other than New York and Los Angeles and ultimately 40 cases of AIDS in 10 cities were linked through sexual contact. These findings coupled with the case control study strongly suggested the new disease was caused by a sexually transmitted agent. So now I'm going to turn back to Bess who will describe concerning developments along another line of investigation. On July 16, 1982, the MMWR reports on three cases of pneumocystis pneumonia in three adult male patients with hemophilia A, which is an inherited blood clotting disorder. The hemophilia cases were investigated primarily by the division of host factors. So Bruce Evett was a hematologist with a special interest in coagulation diseases, so his group really headed this up. Uh, particularly Dale Lawrence went out and did some of the initial interviews. And I think there was no question that this unusual disease was occurring. The question was, is there something else about people with hemophilia that might be predisposing them? So was it simply that they were being exposed to a lot of blood, or were there other possible risk factors? And now we hear from Dr. Bruce Evett, who was the head of the division of host factors and a hematologist. And he discusses the risk factors for acquiring infectious diseases in patients with hemophilia. But with the discovery of cryoprecipitate and then rapidly the uh, use of lyophilized cryoprecipitate or was a concentrate. It wasn't cryoprecipitate, but a modification. Uh, during the 60s, it allowed patients with hemophilia to travel to carry the medicine with them and, and to improve the ability so that life expectancy had climbed dramatically. The problem was that, that concentrates were made from four to five to as many as 20,000 donors that went into this. And during that period of time, there was such a, a need for plasma products that people didn't worry much about uh, blood-borne diseases so that even though everybody got hepatitis from the concentrates, it was such a dramatic change in in outcome for the patients, nobody paid much attention to it and they thought it was expected. Most of it was hepatitis B and non-A, non-B hepatitis. At that time, they didn't know that non-A, non-B hepatitis was the worst because it was hepatitis C in reality. And so that was accepted. And, and there was not much uh, progress in terms of trying to inactivate the virus in the concentrates. The difficulty with the proteins needed for hemophilia that, that they are very labile, 
very sensitive. And so that any kind of inactivation you would use for viruses would most likely destroy the effectiveness of the protein. So people just accepted this. Four more cases in hemophiliac patients were reported in the December 10th, 1982 MMWR. But in that same issue, there is a report on an AIDS-like illness in a 20-month-old infant who received multiple blood transfusions due to RH incompatibility with his mother. One of the donors is subsequently reported to have AIDS. In this next excerpt, Dr. Jaffe describes the public's response to these cases in transfusion patients. It was very alarming to us, and when it was published in the MMWR in December of 1981, it became very alarming to the public. We published two reports that I think caused a lot of concern. One was that, and the second one was a report on uh, children with HIV, well, not HIV because we didn't know it was HIV, children with AIDS um, born to mothers who either had the disease or seemed to be developing the disease. So suddenly the public, which had gotten very little information from the media about this gay disease, started paying attention. I remember probably December of 1981, I'm sorry, 82, uh, sitting in my office in the sub-basement of a building at CDC and there were TV news crews lined up, ABC, NBC, CBS, uh, wanting to talk about these cases. And I thought, well, they're paying attention, but they weren't paying attention before. So suddenly, this wasn't just a gay disease. It was a disease you could get through blood. It was a disease that children could get, and the public stood up and paid attention. We weren't able to interview some very important people who made great contributions. Dr. Stephen McDougall, chief of the immunology branch, who passed away in 2014, demonstrated a methodology whereby heat would inactivate HIV, providing a basis for production of clotting factor concentrate that would no longer transmit HIV in blood. His obituary states, Steve considered his work on thermal inactivation of HIV in transfusion blood products his greatest achievement. This work effectively stopped the exploding HIV epidemic in persons with hemophilia. Now back to Mary. Well, with compelling evidence to support a role for transmission by blood, it was not entirely unexpected when CDC started to hear of cases who reported no other risks apart from working in a healthcare setting. However, investigations of these early reports proved inconclusive. For example, one of the first, uh, only one of the first four cases even reported having sustained a recent needle stick injury. And it was just not possible to rule out other risks with, with any certainty. That said, the specter of occupationally acquired infection was worrisome. And in this next clip, Dr. David Bell explains why. Blood exposures were, were just were so common, they were thought to be unavoidable. I mean, this was normal, uh, you know, for, for uh, when I went to medical school, and you know, certainly, well, for centuries before that, you know, you get some blood on you, so what? You wash it off. Even needle stick was a nuisance. I mean, nobody, we had no idea how many needle sticks occurred. No, nobody reported. So, and, and they were thought to be unpreventable, thought to be unavoidable. So our job was to find out the risk of infection, how the frequency of these at different kinds, I and mean, then what are the circumstances that increase and decrease the risk, and how do you prevent them? Yeah. 
So to try and find answers to some of those questions, in August of 1983, CDC initiated national surveillance to prospectively evaluate healthcare workers who had been exposed to blood and body fluids from a known AIDS patient. The project was commonly known as the needle stick study. And over time, CDC, as well as others, found that the risk of HIV transmission after a percutaneous exposure, such as a needle stick, was approximately 0.3%. In this clip, Dr. Eugene McRae elaborates on this key finding. The big finding um, from the initial study was that uh, most, almost all of the documented seroconversions were in patients that had documented exposure to blood, um, and meaning that, the, and they, and and typically they were um, I, they were um, injured by a large bore needle, um, so, something that's either 18 gauge or, or larger, and and that was critically important because it really emphasized um, or really provided good evidence to just that casual exposure to blood, um, to, to, um, to other body fluids was not really at risk. And we later learned that a lot of the, the risk was related to the concentration of virus available in that, uh, concentration of virus in that, in that fluid. So, um, so blood, we learned that blood, exposure to blood, but almost injection of blood was really what was causing what was the primary cause of transmissions. By the mid-1980s, and coincident with this increased media attention, there was substantial and at times seemingly unrelenting concern about the potential for transmission of HIV through unusual modes, such as casual contact or sharing toilets, foods, or drinks. A new concern arose in April of 1985 when two Florida physicians, Drs. Carolyn McLeod and Mark Whiteside, postulated that environmental factors, including insect bites, were responsible for a high incidence of AIDS and large percentage of cases with no, identifi no identified risk in Belle Glade, Florida. At the time, Belle Glade was an agricultural community of about 16,000 persons. It was also where thousands of migrant workers traveled each year to harvest crops. Over the next 14 months, Dr. Kenneth Castro led a complex, multi-pronged investigation to explore how HIV was being transmitted in the community. The investigation included case interviews, and three neighborhood-based seroepidemiologic surveys to test for antibodies to HIV and several known mosquito-borne infections. The study required some pretty creative logistics, such as using a 24-foot Winnebago camper to travel around Belle Glade. In it, investigators conducted private interviews, did physical exams, and drew blood from participants. In this clip, Ken recalls the cast of thousands that made the study possible. But we were joined by folks from Florida and other parts of CDC. In fact, uh, I, I remember Pauli Marchmonks uh, went down um, uh, and many others uh, who were not working on AIDS because uh, we issued a call and that's the way the study got done, on a shoestring and by borrowing from other parts of CDC uh, fairly shamelessly and uh, everyone stepping up uh, to the task. Um, um, and it was one of the really best parts of being at CDC. People are generous with their knowledge and talents and time. Well, needless to say, no evidence was found to support transmission of HIV by insect bites. Rather, sexual contact, IV drug use, proved to be the principal modes of transmission in Belle Glade. Now these final few slides are going to describe some of the cutting edge laboratory work led by CDC scientists. 
so it was recognized very early on that AIDS was characterized by severe immunodeficiency. And particularly striking was the marked decrease in a type of white blood cell, so-called T helper or CD4 lymphocytes. At the time, CDC was one of the few laboratories to have a fax or a fluorescent activated cell sorter. And it was used, to, for example, to document the steady decline of CD4 cells in patients as their disease progressed. In this photograph, Steve McDougall and Dr. Janet Nicholson are pictured explaining the intricacies of the facts to former President Jimmy Carter. Susan Kennedy, a retired scientist in the immunology branch who kindly shared the photo, noted in her interview that it was pinned to a wall in the lab along with a caption referencing President Carter's pre-White House days as a Georgia peanut farmer. In May of 1983, Drs. François Barry sinoussi and Luc Montagnier from the Pasteur Institute in Paris reported the discovery of a virus they called lymphadenopathy-associated virus, or LAV, and they postulated that it could be the cause of AIDS. Susan Kennedy described how Steve McDougall was keen to use Western blot technology to develop a test to detect antibodies to the virus. The process involved using electrophoresis to separate out viral proteins according to their molecular weight. In this next clip, Susan describes a crucial dilemma. How do you know if a new test is positive? The problem was, what do we call a positive? Because when you develop the first test for something, you don't have anything to compare it to. There were no other tests. So how do you decide what's a positive? Do they need to have an antibody to every one of those proteins? Do they, if they have antibody to only one protein, what does that mean? Does that mean they're positive or negative? And so we had to figure that out, and the only way we could figure it out was to just start testing samples, collections of samples that CDC had on people that were uh, assumed to be positive so because they had symptoms. Patients? Yes. Okay. And then compare it to, no to people, normal controls. Well, over time, it was recognized that it can take anywhere from 3 to 12 weeks after infection to reliably detect antibodies to HIV infection. Doctors Gerald Schockettman and Chin Yi Yo theorized that an approach to detect the virus rather than an antibody could diagnose infection earlier. However, the amount of virus early in, inf in infection, the so-called window period, is low. Their solution was to use a new amplification technique called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, to detect the virus, or the needle in the haystack, as Jerry Schockettman describes in this last clip. And so uh, just at that time, a paper had been published uh, from a scientist at a uh, corporation called CETUS. Uh, in California uh, that developed a technology which allows for the amplification uh, of uh, the nucleic acid, basically uh, making many copies of that needle. Uh, and uh, that uh, subsequently uh, came to be known as polymerase chain reaction. And so um, we uh, contacted the people out in CETUS and asked for their help. We went out, learned the technology, uh, from them, uh, they were kind enough to supply us with a, uh, an important instrument that we needed that uh, could cycle temperature, which was needed to run the reaction, uh, which would have been very difficult to do without that, uh, and made available other reagents to us. And uh, within short order, uh, we were able to uh, be successful uh, in uh, amplifying HIV from patients' blood. Uh, and be able to detect it. Uh, and so uh, that uh, was really the first time that uh, this technology 
uh, or the ability to directly detect uh, genetic information of the virus uh, within a patient's blood cells uh, was achieved. And so that uh, paper, that publication came out in Science, I believe, in 1988. Uh, and it, at that time, it was extremely revolutionary. Today, it's kind of matter of fact, but, uh, and actually won the Charles Shepard Award here for the best scientific paper uh, in CDC. So what do these oral histories tell us about CDC's early response to AIDS? Well, they have certainly broadened and enriched our understanding of the early and, and truly difficult days of the HIV AIDS epidemic. They provide context and insights not captured in medical or scientific publications. And the audio and video files, I, I think, go a long way to humanize the work of so many who were caught up in a race to solve this medical mystery. Many of our narrators highlighted CDC's dogged persistence to find answers using the time-honored approach of shoe leather epidemiologists collaborating with laboratory scientists, and then to harness that information to develop evidence-based guidance and recommendations no matter the political, social, and cultural realities of the day. Walt Doddle captured this perfectly. Dealing with public health controversies is a two-step process. The first is to document the problem, for which there is no substitute for good, solid data. The second is to recommend action to resolve or prevent the problem, for which there is no substitute for good, solid data. Many articulated that teamwork both within CDC and with external partners was essential to success. Jim Curran put it this way, I think one of the actual and important aspects of the CDC is that there is a widespread recognition of the importance of group effort. There has to be organization. There has to be recognition of strengths. There has to be transparency. I learned how wonderful the people were at CDC to work with and how important it was to work with a community of scientists and advocates and affected people to deal with the problem. Lastly, the story of CDC's early response to AIDS as recounted by its leadership, scientists, public health advisors, and other professionals really exemplifies CDC's unique role and long tradition of service on the front lines of public health. Stepping up quickly to investigate and stop a new and frightening disease is at the heart of CDC's mission everywhere and every day. Or in the words of Ken Castro, I think that CDC excelled in having a relatively rapid response being a smaller agency, we were a lot more agile and facile in terms of getting out the door. CDC did what it had to do on a shoestring, and I think that it can be proud as an agency in the nature of the response. I think it had to do with the level of commitment and dedication of the individuals working on this. Finally, let me say, that it has been an absolute privilege for Bess and me to spend time with some of CDC's early AIDS responders. We are most appreciative of their time, their candor, and their willingness to share their stories. Thank you. That was for Bess as well. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Laura. Yes, thank you. Wow. Wow. That is amazing. I am so honored and privileged to um, have been a, a tiny part of pulling some pieces together. And um, I'm so proud to support this agency. I'm the crown jewel of all federal agencies, in my opinion. Um, the CDC Foundation exists to support the world's premier public health protection agency. 
And um, it's just, it was profound for me to hear some of this. I can't wait to dig deeper and, and really learn more about um, what people faced on the front lines in the early years of the response. While so much progress has been made in understanding and addressing the AIDS epidemic, we know there's still so much work to do. We need to continue our understanding of HIV AIDS. We need to communicate how to prevent the disease. We need to understand the barriers. We need to increase access to care and diagnostics. While it is our hope that we never have to tackle an epidemic like HIV AIDS again, we realistically know that infectious disease outbreaks are an ongoing threat. It is our hope that insights and stories from the early response of the HIV AIDS to HIV AIDS will benefit others in the, in the future as we are addressing similar threats. So as we close out, I just want to thank the team, the amazing team once again for their vision, their commitment, the advisory board, uh, Emory Libraries, um, the Office of the CDC Director, and all the individuals who participated in the interviews for your dedication to this important project and helping us preserve this history. And I again want to thank uh, our generous donors, Gilead Sciences and Abbott, uh, for their generous support. And through the work of this team and our donors, these stories are going to be able to live on and help others going forward. So thank you all again for being here, and I'd like to invite everyone to a reception in the museum lobby now. Thank you.